Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulty we had today with uh, with getting uh, the, the, sh the the webinar going. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce a special guest today that everybody, a lot of you know very well. It's Professor, Professor Marshall Khalifert, and he has volunteered to come and talk to us about his research so that uh, us involved in the OSC program can kind of get a a good sense of uh, of what our faculties are doing uh, and so i'm not going to give all the your accolades and medals you know he's a award winner of sorts uh very highly decorated and published and so forth and there you go marshall thanks thanks man thanks for the invitation it's actually cool to be here um because i don't talk much about uh my marine sites for some reason uh except at meetings and so uh this time i tried to uh summarize about or synthesize about 10 years of research we've been doing here uh since 2010 and hopefully it's, i'm not going to run over uh but i want to talk about the role of sediments in water column processes because i think i don't know you guys tell me if i'm wrong a lot of people work in water column not many people work in sediments and the people who work in sediments don't talk to the people who work in water column and the people who work in water column don't care about the sediments right so I think it's important and and uh, to just make that connection. Um, so I'm going to talk about primary production. I'm not going to talk about benthic primary production, so it's nothing to do like that. I'm just going to talk about the application of the sediments for primary production in surface waters. And I'm also going to talk about the importance of sediments in the ocean acidification issue that you know that's pretty in vogue these days, uh, because I think we got some important information from the work we've done in, in sediments. Um, the other challenge of this talk was, because I know you guys are coming from different backgrounds, is to put a chemistry talk together without a chemical equation. And I did. <laughs> it was hard. It was very hard. Until like 10 minutes ago, I removed my last equation. Uh, so I'm a chemist. So it, uh, for me, uh, you know, it's, writing a chemical equation makes perfect sense. You don't need to put things into words. But I know some people don't like chemistry, so I try to avoid that. But I to, in order to put everybody on the same page, I, I have to go through these processes because they're really complex. And I guess you can see it's busy. Um, but hopefully you'll get um, the important message. So when we talk about uh, biogeochemistry of marine sediments, so we talk about sediment diagenesis. It involves, of course, physical, biological processes, but it also involves chemical processes. This is all linked to the carbon inputs to the sediments and how microbes and chemical reactions and the physics work together to process uh, the carbon. And so you can imagine that uh, organic carbon as, as a particle, POM, particle organic matter, sinking to the seafloor. And then over time, of course, we have a lot of particles. Your sediment is buried, right? So that particle is going down with time and the sediment goes up in the water column. Uh, but the sediment is not dead. It's got a lot of microorganisms uh, that work together and basically to survive, consume that organic matter, so degrade that organic matter. And uh, in doing so, they consume uh, electron acceptors. I just changed the battery, but um, oxygen here first, nitrate, manganese oxides, iron oxides, and sulfate. It doesn't look as good on, on the screen. Uh, and in that process, they generate carbonate as CO2, or the sum of the carbonate that we call very often, we call DIC, dissolving inorganic carbon. They produce nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, either in a form of ammonium that's oxidized to nitrate, or ammonium here, or you have denitrification, so that generates uh, nitrogen gas. Uh, and then, of course, phosphate. Phosphate as a nutrient. These species eventually diffuse vertically as the sediment piles up. You have some comp uh, compaction that push the water out of the sediment. Uh, you also have some advective forcing is in some environments. In the end, some of these species can diffuse across the sediment water interface and eventually be mixed up in the water column. Okay? So when we talk about primary production, obviously phosphorus, uh, maybe some ammonium, uh, all nitrate could, could diffuse out. 
And then you talk about primary production limitations, iron is a limiting nutrient. And so in our case, we're very interested in finding out if iron can be fused out of the sediment. Okay. So that's my link to the primary production. And so in our lab, we've been trying to figure out if the diffuse flux of iron across the sediment water interface is significant to maybe sustain primary production. And this has been a debate in the oceanography uh, literature for the last 15, 15, 20 years or so. Um, a lot of people think that uh, iron as limiting nutrients in the ocean is coming from atmospheric depositions. But oceanographers, marine chemists have uh, the last 15 years or so demonstrated actually the sediments could be a source of iron as well. And so we try to quantify that. So when these uh, respiration processes produce this compound, it's not as simple, it's just you know simple production reaction and then eventually diffusion because some of these byproducts, we call them the reduced metabolites. So reduced from manganese would be manganese two, reduced from iron oxide would be iron two, sulfate would be sulfide. These compounds can diffuse up as well and be reoxidized once they reach the oxygen zone. These compounds react with oxygen abiotically. Uh, some of these reactions are faster than others. Iron 2 oxidation is the fastest reaction out there, abiotic reactions. Uh, sulfide is not very fast. Manganese is even slower, manganese oxidation, such that organisms also do that, that trick, they, they catalyze these reactions. But the bottom line is that when these compounds are reoxidized, they generate acidity. It's just because if you write down the reaction, you'll see this, this protons generated in signif significant amount, such that the uh, pH in the surface of the sediment is right. So what we do in my lab to study the systems, we, we get what we call these depth profiles. Uh, basically concentration of species function of depth. And so here we consume oxygen at the sediment water interface. So the oxygen penetration depth is not very high. Not very high. We generate nitrate here for these reactions. So you have a peak of nitrate right below the, the sediment water interface. You generate manganese, iron, ammonia. So you can form all these profiles depending on these reactions. Okay. So the idea is that you use these, these data to try to characterize all these processes and maybe in doing it in a quantitative way using mathematical models, which I'm not going to talk about today. Okay, so th those are the process. Notice I didn't talk much about fermentation because that's something we don't work on, but fermentation is obviously a pretty uh, significant process, generating methane that also escapes the sediments, end up in the water column and eventually in the atmosphere, right? So, so those reactions are also important. Okay, the, the important thing is to know about these, uh, these systems are now looking at the different types of sediments. And so what we know about the transformation of uh, natural organic matter in, in, in continental margin sediments, in, uh, in, in pelagic sediments, there's little uh, organic matter that reached the seafloor simply because if the water column is high here, a few thousand meters, the organic matter is gonna be degraded as it rains down in the water column. And so by the time you get to the sediment, the, the flux of organic matter to the sediment is much lower because it's been degraded already. Uh, it's almost, also mostly refractory. And then the consumption of the oxygen as a res result of the respiration is actually low. Therefore, the zone, the oxygen zone can reach up to 15, 20 centimeters deep in the sediments. Okay. So when you think about that, you think about the processes that release the iron, the sulfide and manganese underneath, these would be diff diffusing up. They'll meet the oxygen, getting reoxidized very efficiently. And so those environments just should generate a lot of acidity, right? These environments should also generate little iron flux because the iron too will be reoxidized, okay? So the iron flux, that's the iron flux to the surface, to the cellular water interface and that'll be low. In the, in the deep sea, the DIC, the, the oh, okay, what's, what is that? Stop sharing, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to hide it. The DIC, so here I wrote the equation, the sum of the carbonate species is not high, but it's not zero either because you still have some respiration. And then when we talk about acidification of the ocean, we're talking about how the sediment could affect the acidification, either by providing more acid 
of providing more base actually to buffer the system. And so the degree of uh, buffering capacity of a, of a system is defined by the alkalinity for the known chemist. It's basically the sum of all the bases in your system compared to this, the acids, okay? So it's the balance between the bases and then the acid. And so if your alkalinity is high, your ability to buffer against a lower, a lower pH is high. Okay, so you can, you can keep the pH relatively high. Uh, and that, for carbonate system, this alkalinity is defined by the cell by carbonate plus two times because you get two charge. It's, it's an equivalent of the carbonate plus the hydroxide ion minus the H plus. Okay. Now, if we look at these numbers from what we know in geochemistry, uh, the acid base properties of the carbonate system in the typical environment, pH is ranging between seven, maybe six in coastal environments, up to eight in, in uh, full seawater. So at this pH, the carbonate is relatively low. So it can be neglected from this equation. The same at pH seven or eight, these two components are not very significant. Okay. So in the end, we can neglect a lot of these species at least in first approximation, such that now you can see the difference between alkalinity and DIC. DIC will always be higher than alkalinity by the fraction of the, carbon, the carbonic acid, okay? So we use the alkalinity to define uh, if there is a reserve of base in the system that can buffer against the acidification of the ocean. Ideally, we know the acidification of the ocean is coming from the atmosphere, right? Atmospheric input of CO2. Ideally, if we're able to release some alkalinity to the surface waters, right, we might be able to buffer uh, the against the acidification of the ocean, okay? The problem is, if you release alkalinity, you release also bicarbonate, which is part of DIC. And so these two entities are, are combined, and then we'll see at the end, uh, in what conditions uh, we can actually uh, prevent the acidification of the urban water. So this is just to talk, to set up the, 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 the system. Now, at low organic matter, we, we got large oxygen results, so we got uh, low flux of iron, low flux of DIC, low flux of alkalinity. Go to the other extreme, in coastal systems where you got a high flux of organic matter, then you oxygen is compressed, it says one to five, but very often it's less than one centimeter. So very small section. Uh, such that you can have a flux of iron that can go through that oxygenated water column. And then you can also, because you have a lot of respiration to consume that oxygen, you produce a lot of DIC. And uh, depending on the processes, you may be able to produce a lot of alkalinity as well. So we'll see that in a minute. In the most extreme case, you have a not welling area. In upwelling areas, basically the transport of bottom waters across the sediment flush the poor waters out of the system of the sediment. And when you do that, you basically have a much larger flux into the water column. Okay, so that's an extreme scenario. Unfortunately, upwelling zones do not cover a, a, a major portion portions of the ocean, right? So these these effects are going to be minor on a global scale. And then lastly, what we're interested in is continental slopes. Slopes are not well characterized. Their effect on these processes are not well known. And simply because they're, they're pretty complex systems, they're exposed to large suspension events. Uh, they're also exposed to slumping, some turbidites. And so the, the sedimentation rates in these environments are very high, but it's also not very constant. And so it's very difficult to study these systems. And then finally, it's also difficult to access because as, as the name indicates, slope are slopey. And so it's difficult to get uh, equipment out there on the seafloor. Okay, so I know that was a long slide on this on, the, on this uh, this introduction. I also re rapidly talk about the other way we can look at sediments: cover preservation versus remineralization. So this is always the, the trade back. If you have uh, a high sedimentation rate, basically you can show that the burial efficiency that we call, we call the burial efficiency is the amount of carbon that's buried in the sediment relative to its flux to the sediment. The burial efficiency typically increased 
we accumulate the sediment accumulation rates or the sedimentation rates, although it's a non-linear relationship. But the interesting point is to look at the details of the, so this is all data from different uh, sediments, different environments. They've been classified as normal marine sediments at the open circle. So that means bottom oxygenate bottoms and, and things like that. Uh, but they also have sediments with low bottom oxygen, those are with the dots. So when you have low bottom oxygen, the respiration of organic matter is not very fast. And so the burial efficiency is high. This is consistent with what people have shown from aerobic respiration. Biologists have shown that for a long time, that aerobic respiration of the organic matter is the most efficient uh, way to degrade organic matter. Now, another interesting point is in deep sea sediments, sediments that are dominated by sulfate reduction, they also fall very high on that relationship, showing again that if you have anoxic sediments, the preserv preservation of organic matter is high. So the degradation is not very intense. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Now, more interesting to us is these points here, which represent deltas, delta X sediments. Um, they're actually very high sedimentation rates, right? Because you have rivering inputs that provide a lot of sediment to the to the these environments. At the same time, you have a lot of carbon remineralization, reoxidation in these systems. And then the preservation efficiency is low. So that raised the question to us, if sulfate reduction uh, in sediment dominated by sulfate reduction tend to preserve, preserve NOM, the organic matter, are uh, iron dominated sediments, such as delta X sediments, where you have a lot of inputs from rivers where the weathering is intense. So you have potentially a lot of minerals uh, in those sediments. Is it more efficient at remineralizing carbon? So that's the question we've been asking. At the same time, we talk about the flux of these nutri nutrients and reduced metabolite, DIC and LTLET, that may affect water column processes. So we're asking the question, do these ocean margin sediments represent a source of diesel iron and then also a source of alkalinity to the urban waters? Okay. So again, the objectives here to determine whether passive margins uh, are not exposed to major river inputs generate benthic iron flux to the urban waters. So most of the work has been done so far with the flux of iron has been done in upwelling zone, simply because it's easier to measure. Uh, it's very challenging, and we discovered that the hard way to measure the benthic flux in, in non-upwelling systems. And so that's why I wrote that proposal a few years ago. We wanted to do this because nobody has ever done it. So we had no clue if the majority of the sediments on Earth would be actually a source of iron, okay? And uh, so I'll show you today some results on that. And then the next question was to determine whether river dominated continental margins allow alkalinity to build up and diffuse across the center of water interface. Okay. So, so far we've done one passive uh, margin, the Cape Lookout in North Carolina, and three ri river dominated continental margins. We did the Congo River, Deep Sea Fan, which is a fantastic environment, the Rhone River in France, and then the Mississippi. I'm not going to talk about the Mississippi because it's Shannon's work. She's going to defend next month, so I encourage you guys to show up. I'll uh, give us some support, but she'll she'll give you everything about she'll talk everything about this uh, for her thesis. So the way we do these measurements, so we use voltammetry, electrochemical techniques, because they allow us to measure several species with one sensor. And so for those of you interested in the uh, engineering and uh, the application of uh, techniques for these for measurements in marine environments. This, uh, you know, it, it took us a long time to develop these methods, but they're really powerful. They can measure oxygen, iron two, manganese, and sulfide with one electrode. We can also measure or qualitatively detect complexes of iron three uh, that are complex to organics. Uh, and then I don't have time to talk about the details on this stuff, but we use those as some kind of redox indicators. If they're there, they're very reactive. So if they're there, that means the redox potential is pretty high in the sun. Okay. They react very quickly with sulfide. The next time that I've done uh, a few years ago. So if uh, typically if you see them in sediments, that means you have no sulfide around. Okay. If their sulfide was there, they would be gone. And then we also use, we can also detect uh, these compounds, FES, that are intermediates in the precipitation of, of sulfide, iron sulfide minerals. Uh, that also we demonstrated a few years ago. 
And so, you know, without having quantitative numbers on these, on these species, they help us understand what type of regime, redox regime we are in the sediment. Are we on the iron reduction regime? Are we on the sulfur reduction regime? Okay. So it allows us to process samples relatively uh, quickly compared to uh, conventional techniques. So these electrodes that we use are shown here. This is just the end electrode, about five centimeter long, got a hundred micron diameter gold wire on, onto which we plate mercury. So it's a liquid surface at the electrode. And then the species basically react at the surface. Behind it, we apply potential um, over time. And so if you see the data here, this is the potential applied at the electrode over time. And then we scan a current. Every time you apply a potential, you have a, re a redox reaction. You generate a current. And so you form peaks, like it was a little bit of like a chromatogram. Okay. Uh, that's the bottom line. The, the bottom line. So over the years, we deployed these systems. It's heat in a variety of environments. We started when I was a postdoc in the water profilers, uh, in the moorings. We also did hydrothermal vents. This is the valve vent where we had electrodes put on the, uh, the end of the arm of Allen to, to uh, sniff the chemistry of uh, hydrothermal vents. And then when I came here at Georgia Tech, this is the first lander we built to do sediment work. Uh, this was built with the undergraduate mechanical engineer who told me at the end when she graduated that she was going to get a job with under fifty thousand dollars starting salary <laughs> building those systems for oil companies and so i was like jealous <laughs> but uh yeah so and then we expanded recently in the last uh, uh five years or so we actually uh rick yankee for those of you who know him he retired a few years ago and he, he was one of the pioneers using these land landers to study the seafloor uh, using these in-situ techniques, and he gave me all his equipment. So this is his old lander for the continental shelf, for sandy shelves. So you've got what we call benthic chambers. There's two of them on this one. It's got a dark lid here and an acrylic lid, so you can look at uh, the effect of light on the, on, the, on the seafloor. This is for shallow environments where you don't have much particles in the in water column, so you have light that reaches over the seafloor. These uh, benthic chambers are basically buckets, if you want, that you plant in the, in the sediment, and then at time zero, you close the lid. Lid is sealed, and then you wait, and over time, the chemicals exchange between the water that's imprisoned in that, in that bucket and in the sediment. And so you can sample with these samplers, shown here on this side, you can sample water, or you can put sensor in, in the chamber, and then monitor over time the exchange of chemicals at the sediment water interface. Um, and it sounds easy, but it's not that easy to use. We use chemical tracers to, to characterize the transport. And then we also, uh, you got to be careful how long you deploy these things. And so there's all kind of uh, issues associated with them. Uh, so this one is for the, <clears throat> the shallow systems where you have typically sandy bottoms. You can, uh, you can deploy it. So the penetration of the, of, this, of the lander in the sediment is not very high. And this one is, or we call it the muddy sediment, uh, muddy lander, where you can basically put it down in muddy environments so it can sink in. The chamber is bigger in height so that it's not un totally submerged. And you can also adjust the height of the feet uh, in case the sediment is really uh, uh, soft. In all these systems, what we've done is not only have the benthic chamber, but also have microprofilers shown here with our electrodes. So that we have these profiles that I showed you earlier, we can get them uh, at the same time as we measure the benthic flux. Okay, so it's kind of unique. Uh, there's only a few groups who can do both the, the profiling and and uh, and uh, benthic flux at the same time. Recently, this is a plug for our latest project. We've been doing measurements in blue holes. You guys know what blue holes are? You heard of those? They're sinkholes. They're sinkholes, but in the ocean. So uh, these are in Florida. That's where you have typically you have sinkholes. They sink, huh? So the one we studied so far is about 75 feet diameter, which uh, raised the point that you, the, it's about 35 meters water column to the bottom of the seafloor, and then after that you get another 75 meters of of uh, of uh, sinkhole until you get to the seafloor. And so those systems are pretty amazing because. Uh, 
they basically recycle. It's basically the primary production and sediment respiration recycling. It's like a mini world, basically, where you have the nutrients sinking. I mean, you got nutrients reaching to the sediment water interface to the to the to the top of the of the hole. You got primary production because you got light. You got fish because you got you got photosynthesis. You got phytoplankton. You got fish. You got a lot of detrital matter that falls back in the hole. Then you got secondary production, respiration in the sediments, sediment piling up, then respiration in the sediments, regenerating the nutrients, and you start the cycle. So it's really photosynthesis, respiration, photosynthesis, respiration. It's pretty cool. And the uh, amount of uh, sediment that accumulates in the system is pretty high. The problem was in the system was to from the surface of the uh, on the small ship to be able to deploy the lander in a 75 uh, feet diameter hole at 35 meters above, right? You got to aim very accurately. So it was very difficult. So we decided to use uh, divers. And so we put some floats. That's the same lander as you saw in the picture before. Put some floats and then the divers take it down to the bottom. It was pretty cool. Lots of sulfide and lots of sulfate reduction in the system. There's actually sulfide diffusing all the way to about the mid water column in the in the in these uh, in these holes. And then we have actually PBS. I don't know if you guys know the Changing Seas program. They filmed us. They interviewed us for hours and hours and hours for like a 20, 20 minutes or thirty minutes uh, documentary that's going to come out in June to discuss this, these uh, these systems. They're poorly understood. And then the last one we've been used. <laughs> so this is a deep sea lander, which is actually free. So we um, we actually uh, uh, let this guy go, and then we hope he comes back. So it's got uh, extra lift, uh, extra weight to sink down to the bottom, it's got floats here. And then when it's done with the measurements, it releases the weights <coughs> to the bottom and then pops back. When it pops back to the surface, it's got a GPS and it sends me an email to tell me where it is and we can go pick it up, okay? Uh, so in principle, that's the way it works. Okay, so, uh, yeah, in principle. Uh, so in all these systems, we have the same vacuum chamber. We measure the flux, we measure, we collect water samples over time, you can see here. We have the micro ventilator here on the back. The electrodes are right here. They're going down next to the chamber. So we're within basically a foot from the benthic chamber. So we have both access to the flux of the interface and then the profile in the center. Okay. Um, this is the type of data we get when we do these measurements. So this is two electrodes. I separated the data. One electrode here and one electrode here. I just showed you that picture. They're about five centimeters apart vertically. And so as you can see in the first uh, shot, there's actually very good overlap between the data set. And you can see these beautiful with high resolution profiles in the sediment. I don't want to spend too much time on this. So I'm going to show you uh, three studies that we did uh, with the systems. This, the first one, we actually didn't do any in situ measurements because we didn't have the logistics. Uh, this is a, a cruise that we did in 2011. Uh, on the Pukwapa, which is a French uh, ship, which is really nice. You have the opportunity to go on a French ship because the food is so good. They got wine that I'm fantastic. And um, this is a 350 foot long ship, so it's a really big ship, about 54 crew. Uh, and then the French are really interesting because they're syndicated. You cannot do uh, deck work. So as scientists, we do not do deck work. It's pretty interesting. Uh, so in the U.S., we basically used to do everything when we go on ships. And so there, you can only get close to the line, and then they say, uh-uh. <laughs> and then it just hand you the sample. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, but we deployed uh, a, a sediment corer. We did this work also with the ROV, which actually is really cool, because the ROVs can work 24 hours, right? So you don't worry about, you know, uh, with Alvin, it's nine hours maximum time on the, on the during a dive. Here you can work for like 48 hours, no problem. You can get all the sediments, all the samples you want. Uh, so in this uh, system, we did a lot of work with geologists, with microbiologists. Here they map 
the seafloor with a high resolution bathymetry to look at the Congo. The Congo has got a great, amazing water discharge, about 75,000 cubic meters per second. Got a pretty high discharge, center of discharge, uh, 30 to 150, depending on the season, I guess, megaton per year. Um, and because the system, the flow is so intense, it actually, the, the Congo dug a dent in the shelf. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but the, it's basically a big canyon from the mouth of the Congo that goes straight down to 5,000 meters. If you look at this map, this is about 5,000 meters. And at the bottom, you see those canyons. On this map, this is an old one. This is an active one. And then they call them deep sea fans because the uh, particles that accumulate there eventually fall off into some kind of avalanches and then they spread out into fans. And so we study these four different stations um, <clears throat> uh, over like a month long uh, time period. This is about 1,000 kilometers offshore, just to tell you. Okay. This is the most amazing sediments I've ever seen. You see pictures here, very dark, and very uh, and rich coming from the continent. And so when you do these measurements, uh, here we got a sediment core from the bank of one of these channels. This is the type of data we get. I'm not going to show you all the data sets, but you can see that oxygen is consumed very quickly, about a centimeter. Uh, and then underneath, you see iron 2 production in pretty high concentration, 700 micromoles. It's really high for deep sea sediment. Uh, and then we see these complexes of MP3, these organic MP3 complexes pull out the, the sediment column. At the same time, we, we see a decreasing pH. I was mentioning that to you. Right, because of the respiration, so that decreasing pH. Uh, and then it looks like it's coming back a little bit here, uh, but not that much. We see also, we we'll look at the concentration of iron oxides. So the geochemists have developed methods to quantify iron oxides using wet chemical techniques. And so we use uh, what we call ascorbate iron, exactly corresponding to freshly uh, formed iron oxide. And then dietinic iron, which is more crystalline iron oxides, more age, more refractory uh, type of compound. Uh, so as you can see, the sediments is really composed of fresh uh, iron oxide sediments over the, at least the first 12 and 15 centimeters. So when we do these, these measurements at each station, we can start compiling. This is the stock of iron in the pore waters only. And so you can see here the stations and, uh, called A, which is the first stations along from the bottom of the slope, and then called uh, S, which is the second one along the active channel, and called C, the third one, contained the highest iron concentration in the disulfate. So potential for diffusion of these species to the surface and then fluxing out. Unfortunately, we couldn't measure, at the time we didn't measure that, uh, we did the study. Uh, but as you can also see, is that if you go off axis from the, from the channels, you got much less reactivity. The, the Paul E site is an ancient uh, a canyon from you know, uh, thousands of years ago. And so there's no uh, inputs from the river at this site, so you don't see much activity. Okay. So it's really the iron that drives uh, this system. Now the question is that you're in the middle of the ocean, you have tons of sulfate, you should see sulfate reduction. So why don't we see sulfate reduction in the system? That's a big question. And so here we look at the correlation between these compounds, organic FE3 compounds and FE2 that we measure electrochemically in the system. And as you can see, it's not a perfect correlation, but there is a positive relationship between the system. I also here compare a few stations from the Gulf of Mexico I right hear all the stations from the Congo. Uh, there is a, definitely a, a relationship there. Uh, so we've been studying these compounds for a long time now uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Tom De Cristiano's group. And so we know from the work I did when I was a postdoc that these compounds can be formed by oxidation of iron two. If you have oxidation of iron two, so you have oxygen and iron two, but you include organic ligands on there, you can stabilize this compound in the dissolved form as opposed to precipitation. Uh, it turns out you can stabilize this compound. I demonstrated in that paper for, for months, even in seawater. And so iron 2 oxidation could generate this compound. The problem is you would have to generate 
oxidation of iron two here at about 10 centimeters, you know, down to 20 centimeters, where the oxygen penetration is only one centimeter. So this disconnect between the supply of oxygen in the system and that process. So we think that for that reason, this compound cannot be explained by iron two oxidation. Remember, those are in situ measurements. We, we go in, so there's no artifact associated with the, uh, with the measurements. So the alternative is actually something we demonstrated with this decreasingness group is that iron reducers generate this compound during the reduction process. And so what we're thinking, our theory on this, and we're still working, we've been working a long time on, on, on these problems. We think that the bacteria, in order to access, to, to give the electrons to the iron oxide, which is a mineral, they cannot ingest the minerals. So they have to dissolve it first before they can reduce it. So our idea is, is that these compounds are produced as intermediates in iron reduction. Okay. So there's other, a couple of other alternatives, but for the, ma for the majority of our samples, and I can show you that for all the system we're working uh, in, we see this positive correlation between these compounds. So it's possible that these compounds could be indicators of microbial iron reduction. So if that's the case, then the question is to know why sulfur reduction is not important because we still have with seawater, we have 28 millimolar iron oxides. Uh, sulfate in the system. So we can look at thermodynamics to find the answer. So this is the delta G as a function of the concentration of the product for sulfate reduction compared to iron reduction. And we use two different types of iron oxides. One that's more refractory, more crystalline, goatite, and then one that's more uh, amorphous, HFO, it's uh, hydrospheric oxide or, or ferric hydride. Uh, and so you can show from this calculation that if you increase the concentration of the product of the reaction, right? Thermodynamics tell you that's Le Chatelier's principle. If you increase formation of the product, the reaction should go the other way, right? So that the delta G of the reaction will increase, becomes more positive, okay? That's why you see in all these three reactions, uh, you see a, 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 an increase in the delta G when you increase the concentration of the product. But the differences between goatite and, and the ferrohydrate is pretty uh, uh, flagrant. The fact that you can have a minimal iron two from that reaction and your delta G is still minus 200. As opposed to the goatite, if you have, let's say one micromole, your delta G is minus 150. So that means if microbes are faced with both ferrohydrate and goatite, they will choose the okay, they'll produce the Fe2 up to one millimolar if the delta G is not going to increase. Then after that, it'll increase. Okay. For sulfate reduction, you see the same effect, but the delta G for sulfate reduction is actually much more positive or less negative than for fair hydrate. Okay. So in all time, if you have fair in your system, no matter what the concentration of sulfide is, no matter what the concentration of iron 2 is, you, you, uh, fair hydra will be more favorable thermodynamically than sulfate for reduction. And then the opposite is true for goatite. If you have, let's say, about this is uh, 10 micromole, 10 micromolar goatite, uh, sorry, 10 micromolar Fe2 in equilibrium with goatite. So that's pretty low, right? You will see that sulfate reduction becomes more favorable. So in other words, in systems where you have, you're enriched in very reactive iron oxides, sulfur reduction cannot thermodynamically be favorable. Okay. So that's, that's why I would explain how uh, iron reducers would not compete sulfur reducers. Make sense? Okay. So the application for carbon cycles in, from this study is that the iron concentrations are about three times higher than sulfate concentration in terms of carbon equivalent. Uh, so that again shows you you got enough electron acceptor here with iron to be able to dominate uh, carbon organization. And then this is likely underestimated without going to the details because you also precipitate some of these uh, byproducts, uh, which is not a common in this calculation. Even if the Concentration of iron oxide is smaller than sulfate. You also can have fast reoxidation. Remember, I mentioned that iron 2 is very uh, um, reactive. 
So then it's sustained microbial reduction because you regenerate the iron oxides constantly. Okay. So what about a diesel iron flux? Uh, we didn't have uh, that study. We didn't think about that at the time. This was in uh, 2010 or 11. So we started thinking about this here uh, in our backyard in the, uh, the Cape Lookout, so it's North Carolina, just, the, uh, just uh, south of the Outer Banks. We've done a lot of cruises over the years, mostly to de uh, develop our equipment, but also to do some science. Uh, that we actually just recently published, it's still in press, uh, across the slope. So this is a, a, a system where there's no major upwelling, there's no rivering inputs. So it's ideal to test the idea that, or the hypothesis that the flux of iron is, is significant in these environments. And again, we got all these profiles. So this is actually a pretty unique data set because it's not very common to see uh, profiles across the sediment from shore, zero to 20 meters, to the deep sea, 2,600 meters. You can't do this at this place because the margin is very uh, short. It's about 75 or 80 kilometers. And so you can cover that, that uh, area. And again, you know, without going into the detail, you see the oxygen consumption in the sediment. The oxygen penetration is going uh, deeper as you go on the shelf. But then once you reach the slope, you see all the things going on. The blue here, the light blue is these organic FP3 complexes. The red is the FP2 produced. And then you see some sulfate reduction going on at the blue in the sulfide, only in that mid slope. So in the middle of the slope, okay? So again, just to show you, mid slope is, uh, sorry, right there, in the middle of that slope. So it suggests these environments, you know, are very, very similar to coastal systems. So the question is why? And then, so when we look at these, uh, these data, we can come up with uh, fluxes. So here we'll look at the flux of oxygen. So in the flux of oxygen is high, at, in the coastal sites because you have a lot of respiration. And when you get on the shelf, you get more sandy shelves, so there's not much organics. And so the, the rate decrease. And then when we get to the slope, then they increase again. And then when you get back to the bottom of the slope in the abyss, then the, uh, the, the, car, the oxygen decreases. So we clearly see an increase in, in respiration in the mid slope. And then when we look at uh, the, the flux, this is the diffusive flux of iron and sulfide, we also see, I guess, a high in the coast, decreasing and then maximum flux near the sediment water interface. We can do the same thing with these organic FP3 complexes. Basically, the bottom line is that we can calculate a flux. It's not across the sediment water interface, so we took a lot of heat from the reviewers about that because we, we couldn't measure right at the sediment water interface, but we basically less than a centimeter below the interface. So there's a flux of iron too in there. And then we also did incubations that don't compare well, but we know that these incubations create artifacts so we can, that we can explain. So the bottom, bottom line is a, a iron flux. And then we compare this approximately about the same time we were writing the paper. Uh, Andrew Dale came out with uh, 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 some kind of equation for global modelers because the iron flux from the sediment needs to be, we need to take into account that iron flux to, to contribute to the uh, primary production in surface waters. And so the global modelers are very interested in uh, coming up with these numbers. Taka is doing a lot of that work. Uh, and so Andy came up with this, this relationship. So he, he took all the data set that he found in literature, came out this relationship between the, iron, the diffusive, the, the, sorry, the dissolved iron flux and then the bottom oxygen concentration an empirical relationship, it gives you an equation, it gives you values, and you can plug in your model. When we put our data on that curve, this is where we stand. So this is from the uh, measurement in the oxygen zone, this is from activations. It's very close or closer to two studies that were neglected in that paper. And these two studies are pretty important because this is the first paper actually that demonstrated that iron was fluxing, fluxing in the, in the uh, water column. Uh, uh, but he, he wanted to remove this data set from the paper because they were uh, too strong of a boiling zone. Okay. So what, while we put our, our data on that paper, on that curve, we fall outside. So that means the flux of dissolved iron is much higher than estimated here from this calculation. So we can think about uh, explanation as to why is that. Um, 
there may be some exaggeration of the flux determined by the, the sediment profiles and the, uh, the incubations. But we think by using a vol voltammetric profiles, we get the spatial resolution that's really high. So we don't have any artifacts from that. So we, we, don't, we, we argue that our measurements are actually the most accurate you could do from, from uh, uh, profiles, from depth profiles, as opposed to measuring benthic flux directly. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot measure these diffusive flux of organic F3 complexes using our electrodes because we can't quantify them. And so that's, that's our problem. The incubations, we know that they don't account for the oxidation by iron two that would generate a flux of these complexes because there's no oxygen in our incubation. They're designed that way. So basically we minimize the oxidation. That's why those numbers that I showed you earlier would be a little bit low. And also there's FES precipitation because now if you don't have oxygen, you might be able to promote sulfur reduction so you will immobilize iron into the salt phase. So that would also decrease the iron flux. But the bottom line is that when we think about it, if iron 2 in up one zone, it's diffusing out of the system, basically entrained by the current, it might not be, uh, its, uh, it's uh, residence time might be very low because it will be re-oxidized immediately and precipitate back. And why is that? Because it doesn't have time to react with the ligands to complex with the Fe3. So that's what we're thinking. If the system is really active, it's advective and pushing up the stuff out of the sediment, then it doesn't have time to react with ligands during the oxidation process. I suppose in a non-upwelling system where it's much more stagnant, if you want, the diffusion is slow, and so the iron 2, while it gets oxidized, has the time to be, to be complex. And then we know that from lab experiments, because when we do these lab experiments, in the same conditions, when we agitate, when we stir, we precipitate everything. But we don't stir, we can produce these compounds in solution for a long time. So we think that's maybe the difference between those type of environments. And that's why our flux actually are much higher than these upwelling systems. Okay. So we just published this. We'll see what happens. Uh, we, we were forced by some reviewers to do some extrapolations. Some reviewers hated it. Some reviewers loved it. So we had to compromise with the editor. But we decided to expand our mid-slope, accounting for mid-slope representing 25% of the total ocean, uh, uh, the total uh, slope, continental slope area of the oceans. Uh, and then when you do that, including even 75% loss by precipitation, let's say we got this flux, but we say 75% of it's going to be lost by precipitation. Okay? Even if we do that, we have numbers that fall right into these two studies that I showed you earlier. Uh, with the upwelling zones that uh, Dale neglected in his calculations compared to his own calculation where he separate the shelf sediment from the slope sediment that basically two orders of magnitude lower. Okay. Uh, so it suggests that these environments may represent some previously overlooked source of iron to the ocean. Okay. So we don't have many benthic fluxes, but we have some. And this is the data from the benthic lander collected about 600 meters on that slope. And uh, so the data you can see from the diffusive profiles, we see these organic F3 complexes all the way to the surface. And then we got the benthic chamber data that shows a nice in blue, a nice phosphate nutrient release from the sediment. And then in, uh, in black, the speciation of dissolved iron into the, the syringe that was collected in the benthic chamber. As you can see, the result iron goes up to a certain point and then drops. So we see that flux, we can measure it, but apparently its life uh, expectancy is not very high. So we don't know at this point if it's an artifact on the chamber because chamber is also mixing a little bit to make sure it maintains um, a homogeneous, an homogeneous system. And so this is more to come on this. We got more, actually more data on this that we need to, uh, to process. Okay, do I have time to finish? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go five more minutes so far. So this is the last study on the Rhone River. So this is where we look at the effect of uh, the respiration processes on the flux of alkalinity. So the Rhone River, again, uh, represents on the main source of fresh water to the Mediterranean Sea, it's about 1700 cubic meter per second. They got some really strong storms out there uh, in this environment. So sometimes they really have a huge discharge uh, 
of, of sediments in, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea. We studied three different uh, domains along the gradient from the mouth of the roof of the road uh, to the shelf rate right down here. Um, and then we did both benthic measurements, flux measurements. I don't have time to show you all the data, so I'm just going to go jump, jump to the, the benthic flux data. This is alkalinity flux, so we call it total alkalinity because that's one we measure, but it's essentially the same as the carbonate alkalinity I was showing you uh, at the different station over time. And as you can see at the station A, Z, and Z prime, we did the station twice. Basically, uh, the station that closes to the mouth of the river, we have a, a very high flux, benthic flux of alkalinity, and obviously also a benthic flux of DIC. When you compare the two, you can see that essentially around the same. And then as you go offshore, these fluxes decrease. So this is really benthic flux of alkalinity and DIC. So at least this means, because these numbers are similar, then the, the sediments do not contribute to the acidific acidification of the water column. Okay, as opposed to normal systems where typically the DIC flux is higher than the alkalinity flux. So if you compare this to other studies, this is the ratio. So if you compute the ratio of alkalinity to DIC, you cannot exceed one, right? Remember from that least first equation? I guess I should have put it back here. This first equation, the DIC is always going to be higher than the, than the alkalinity. And so our data shows the red dots that our system is one of the closest to one compared to others in the different type of environments, suggesting, you know, at least when you get these values between 0.1 and 1, uh, 0.8 and 1, basically the uh, alkalinity flux does not buffer the available water against the ocean acidification, but it prevents further acidification from respiration in the sediment. Remember, respiration in the sediment will generate DIC, right? But if your alkalinity is high, this DIC mostly going to be under the form of bicarbonate. So it will not contribute to acidification of the water column. That makes sense? So now we uh, can explain this. I guess I tried to do, do this as a drawing. In these sediments, if you have acidification in the underlying water, this is the crossings here. You also have respiration. Iron 2 and manganese respiration in these river dominated sediments where you have a lot of minerals coming to the to the uh, to the coastal environment, then uh, eventually these species will diffuse up, and when it diffuse up, then you precipitate the iron oxide, the manganese oxides, and then what you do in the precipitation, you start titrating these proteins because you generate alkalinity. The alkalinity goes up to titrate the protein, you form H two CO three. So in that case, your alkalinity flux is going to be low and then the DIC flux is going to be high. And so you'll have a profile like this, oops, uh, a profile like this, where you have an excess DIC and, and the low alkalinity. So now you generate acidity to your system, you know? So the, 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 uh, these type of environments will contribute to the acidification of the ocean. And then if uh, you have sulfate reduction, so the same system, Manganese and iron reduction in the system, but now you come up with sulfate reduction in NEF because you got enough carbon to promote sulfate reduction. Then eventually you will generate FES. You'll start precipitating iron sulfide minerals. So now you're preventing these two guys to get reoxidized by the oxygen. And so when the bicarbonate will diffuse up, it will freely go through the interface. Yeah because there's no proton generated by the reoxidation of the iron and the sulfide. And so in that case, your ratio of DIC to TA, uh, total alkalinity is close to one, and then you contribute, you don't, the sediment doesn't contribute to the acidification of the ocean. It doesn't prevent the acidification, it doesn't buffer the other and water column, but it doesn't contribute further to the acidification. So the big issue right now, so I think we demonstrated that some people have done that before, but the big issue that we have now is to um, figure out what is the temporal evolution or variations of these processes, simply because river and discharge in these environments varies over time. You think about the Mississippi River, you have uh, seasonal variations, high discharge that provide this huge load of sediments, and then low discharge, 
where you basically the sediment has allows to cook. And so we try to study, we propose to study how these uh, environments uh, evolve over time. Uh, and that's the next project. We just got funded actually to go back and do this. Okay, I'll stop here. Just hopefully I convince you that voltammetry provides new insights in the redox cycling of variance competition with sulfur reduction. These complexes allows us to provide some more information on the sediment and the traditional methods. Then the continental slope sediments, maybe uh, uh, location was microbiome reduction, maybe significant. Um, and then the dissolved iron may flux out of the sediment, providing a significant source of iron to overlying water. But now the question is, is it going all the way to the surface? Still, still in question. And then finally, that these, these sediments represent significant source of CO2 to the environmental water, except when sulfur reduction is intense, because now you can bury the iron and sulfur, avoiding the reoxidation, and then generate an alkaline flux at the sediment water interface. All right, I'll stop here. I'll just, uh, this is the work by, by three of my students, Aaron Aitel, who, who, who uh, graduated last year, I guess, a year and a half. Or a year ago, I guess. Is that more than that? Two years? Sorry, sorry. Two years. Jordan Beckler, who graduated in, uh, five years ago, and then Shannon is graduating next. And then a bunch of other people involved in these crews. So I'll thank you. I'll take any questions.